Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave. Ca. So this week's edition of the Nipua Banner and Press is dated Friday, October 11th, 2024. Now on the front page we have a, an artist rendering of the proposed 50 suite senior living complex for Minnedosa. Wow! New details unveiled on highly anticipated senior housing project in Minnedosa by Owen Devereaux. Some exciting and completely unexpected new details have dropped related to a seniors active living facility that's been in the works for Minnedosa for almost a year. During the health and wellness fair at the 50 plus activity center on October the 4th, representatives with Valley Life Housing Group Inc. shared information on their proposed 50 suite senior living complex. As well, newly created art renderings for the facility were shown to the public for the first time. Grant Butler, who is a representative of Valley Life Housing, shared that the committee is currently working on the business plan. Butler stated that, as it currently stands, the cost for the project is around $18 million, with between 3 to $5 million of that to be covered through local fundraising efforts. It goes on to say... Right here... The rest of the cost to be covered through loans, possibly through the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. As for when there could be a shovel in the ground, Butler stated that they have set an ambitious timeline. He said, if everything goes the way we hope it will go, we're hoping to start digging in 2025. That's the goal, but it all depends on fundraising. That will depend on how land acquisition goes through. The town of Minnedosa has set aside the land for us at this point in time. They haven't donated the land. They've just, you get first choice on that land. That expires in December 2025 because they want to be able to resell it if need be. So we are on a bit of a time crunch. Once construction were to begin, it is estimated that it could take over a year to complete. Co-chair Gaylene Johnson spoke with the banner and press immediately after the presentation and noted that this is a very exciting time for the proposal. We started over a year ago with the initial push out there that this is what we were doing. It's been quiet for a while, but there were some new details we could confirm. So we thought this was a good opportunity at the wellness fair to say, hey, we're still out here, we're still working, and this is where we're at, noted Johnson. Having this presentation with the visuals from the renderings, it, it gets people excited and it will hopefully be the kickoff to the fundraising. As for how fundraising efforts will proceed, Johnson said it's too early to get into specifics, but that every idea is on the table, including corporate sponsorships. Valley Life Housing Group Inc. is a non-profit made up of representatives from seven surrounding RMs. So there's a couple of pictures that go with it. A view of how the suites may look at the proposed senior living center. It's lovely. And down here, seen above is a view of the town of Minnedosa with the homes to the left here. The town of Minnedosa set aside a section of land for the Valley Life Housing Group to allow them first pick. The first pick deal will expire in December 2025, so the town may resell if needed. 
I've been watching this uh, develop. It's all it's already paved now those streets. Anyways. Now, along talking about this health and wellness fair held in Minnedosa, uh, there's a picture of that happening there on October 4th by Owen Devereaux. The answers to healthy living for adults over 50 were accessible in Minnedosa on Friday, October the 4th at the Health and Wellness Information Fair. The third annual event was held at the 50 Plus Activity Centre and featured 20 different booths with an array of information from local groups and businesses. Minnedosa and District Service to Seniors Rep Resource Coordinator Elise Richards said she was very pleased with this year's local response to the fair as there was quite the crowd in attendance. She noted there was a lot of valuable information to be had. This is an event that promotes a lot of relevant health and wellness information as well as programs that are available locally. This is our third annual fair and it just seems to be engaging more and more people each year. This year we were able to offer a presentation with public health, giving us information on vaccines that are available and recommended as we age. As well, there was an impromptu presentation from Valley Life Housing Group on the proposed active living facility planned for Minnedosa. Richards said the feedback from both the vendors and attendees was overwhelmingly positive and inspires service to seniors to make the day even bigger and better in 2025. Wow, that's very exciting. Now at the Roxy Theater, this weekend will be closed for Thanksgiving, but it will open up again the weekend after, October 18th and 19th. The uh, movie that we'll be showing is called Transformers 1, showing at 7.30 both evenings. NAC TV will be hosting an annual general meeting 2024 and volunteer appreciation October the 24th at 7 p.m. NAC TV is looking for board members. <laughs> All right, I'll come back to that later. And that. All right, we'll talk about Out of Helen's Kitchen by Helen Drysdale. This week, it's featuring Thanksgiving appropriately. Thanksgiving is a day meant to remind us of our many blessings. Counting our blessings helps us recognize what we take for granted in our daily lives. As we sit down to a meal surrounded by the love of family and friends, may we learn to develop the value of intentionally counting our blessings in life every day. Brightly colored orange pumpkins are a staple for fall decoration. I, however, prefer my pumpkins made into hearty soups, savory dishes, and sweet treats like pumpkin pie. But you don't have to be limited to just pumpkin pie. Try these easy to make pumpkin desserts for your special day or just every day. Pumpkin crisp is a great finish to any meal. This dessert can be whipped up quickly and is perfect for the Thanksgiving holidays. So she has a pumpkin crisp recipe, which I think I might try. And a pumpkin pudding, both using pumpkin puree, cans of pumpkin puree. Yeah. All right, uh, the RCMP report, a grocery theft crackdown underway, what? By Sergeant David Taggart. In the month of September, the Spruce Plains RCMP had 310 occurrences. This month, we laid 117 traffic-related tickets. We found one person impaired by alcohol and three to be impaired by drugs. This month, there were three trucks and two quads that were stolen. Should you have property stolen, do not wait till after the weekend to report the crime. Please call 911 and report it. There was a theft of groceries from several businesses in the area. What? 
We used the RCMP social media page to put out photographs of the suspects. In one instance, all three suspects were identified. Charges are pending. We also had two instances of persons passing counterfeit bills. This is rare and we encourage people working in retail if they are unsure if a bill is legitimate or not to check with their manager. On September 21st, the Spruce Plains RCMP conducted a traffic stop in Nipua. During the course of the traffic stop, police found the driver to be in possession of tobacco products which were unstamped. In accordance with the Excise Act, the driver was placed under arrest and during the course of the search, the officer discovered methamphetamine cash and a mobile device. As a result, a Dodge Grand Caravan was seized as offense-related property and is pending forfeiture. The driver, 47-year-old J.T. Santos of Nipua, has been charged with possession for the purpose of trafficking methamphetamine, methamphetamine and possession of proceeds of crime. The investigation continues. Speeder of the month was a 38-year-old driver from Dauphin going 145 in a 100 zone. Oops. And here's an anti-fraud tip from the RCMP. Taxpayer or Canada Revenue Agency scam. A scammer claims to be an employee of either the Canada Revenue Agency or Service Canada. They state you have a compromised SIN number an outstanding case against you, owe back taxes, have unpaid balances, or committed a financial crime. They threaten that if you do not speak to them immediately, you'll be arrested, fined, or even deported. The scammers may request payment via money service businesses, prepaid gifts or, or gift uh, cards or gift cards, iTunes, Google Play or stream, steam, stream cards or Bitcoin. So please be careful of that. Now, um, this picture, if you want to get the camera on here, is a history update um, from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Nipua Banner Press has an update regarding this photo from Old Canada series, which was featured in the September 27th, 2024 edition of the Nipah Banner Press. Lorna Cowan reached out and noted that her two sons, Bill and Brian Howe, can be seen here. Bill and Brian can be seen at the front of the group, closest to the camera and looking at the leader. Bill and Brian were born in 1957 and 59, which would change the original time period estimate for the photograph from the 50s to potentially the late 60s, at least, perhaps 1967 or, or later. Bill would have been either 9 or 10 here and Brian 7 or 8. <laughs> uh, it's funny because the girls are all wearing bathing caps, which used to be the, the rage back then. All right, Nipua Chamber, Concerned About Road Deterioration by Owen Devereaux. Nipua's business sector has voiced its desire for a clear plan on the long-term repairs to the town's streets. The Nipua District Chamber of Commerce, on behalf of its membership, recently forwarded a letter to Town Council related to the conditions of roads throughout the community. The rough shape of the streets, sidewalks and curbs are related to a much milder than usual winter last year. Those conditions caused a few issues with the large number of potholes created due to the freezing thawing cycle. Nipua, along with almost every other community in western Manitoba, found themselves dealing with these types of problems. Funding was set aside in this year's budget for several repairs, including a complete repaving of blocks on Mill and Hamilton Street. Some of those major improvements ran into a roadblock of sorts, however, as in late August, the province announced the complete repair of 18th Street in Brandon. That multi-million dollar project ended up being the priority for all the available paving companies pushing Nipua and a few other small towns further back on the waiting list. 
Back to the Chamber of Commerce letter, which was read aloud at the Council meeting on Tuesday, October the 1st. It began with the Chamber expressing its appreciation for all the hard work and dedication that is put in by Council, Administration and staff. It says, we want to make sure that alongside addressing this urgent matter, we also acknowledge and thank you for the ongoing efforts in making Nipua a better place for all residents. Your commitment to our community does not go unnoticed and we are grateful for what you do. As, However, as in the case with most letters that start with the positives, it was followed up with what could be called a however statement in relation to the physical condition of several streets. On behalf of Nipua and District Chamber of Commerce and our 110 members, we are writing to express our collective concerns regarding the current conditions of the roads, sidewalks and curbs in our community. The Chamber letter continued by expressing concern about how the street's current state could impact the local economy. It has come to our attention through member and visitor feedback that the poor state of our roads is causing considerable concern. Vehicles are at risk of damage and this perception alone may deter both locals and visitors from traveling to Nipua. Such a deterrent may lead to a decline in economic activity directly affecting the vitality of our businesses and the community at large. The letter also highlighted a desire for more sidewalks to route walking traffic to business areas. Upon receipt and reading of the Chamber letter at the Council meeting, Nipua Mayor Brian Headley acknowledged the points that were brought up. He said, Yes, we are totally aware of our nice, warm, freeze-thaw winter that really aggressively deteriorated the streets around town. Yes, we do have plans in place, and yes, we will be reviewing a lot more in the coming months as well, stated Brian Headley. All right, next, still on the topic of the Nipua Town Council, Tuesday, October 1st by Owen Devereaux. The most recent council meeting for the town of Nipua was held on Tuesday, October 1st. The meeting was just under an hour and featured several local matters, including the following council reports. First, Lisa Pottinger. Uh, she updated Council of a meeting of the Beautiful Plain Medical Clinic Committee where the resurfacing of the floors in the clinic's exam room was approved. The carpets within those rooms will be removed and replaced with solid surface floors. Next, Jason Nadeau. He provided a brief update on the most recent Westlake Employment and Regional Library Board meetings. One item highlighted was the plan for the Library Board to start reviewing budget details at the next meeting on October 16th. A regional bookmobile idea is also currently being discussed. As for the Nipua Public Library specifically, there will be a revision of employee hours. For 2025, there will be additional employee hours added on Thursdays and Saturdays within the existing schedule. In June, there were 1,400 items checked out of the Nipua Library, while in July, that number rose to 2,024, but slowed down slightly in August to a still respectable 1,888 checkouts. One final meeting on Nadeau's schedule was with the Rossburn Trail Association, a reminder that motorized vehicles are not allowed on the trail with the exception of snowmobiles in the winter. Next, Murray Parrott. He expressed his support and appreciation of Touchwood Park Association and its recent efforts with the creation of a new play structure. He said it's another great addition to the community brought forward by an array of local volunteers and supporters. As well, Parrott provided some information on the recent visit from the World Trade Center Winnipeg, Tourism Manitoba and more who toured our community. He said it was a tremendous opportunity to show the rest of the province what a great community we have. Next, Yvonne Sisley. She informed Mayor and Council of some recent meetings including one with seniors at the Yellowhead Manor. She also referenced 
the chambers and business meeting previous brought up by Councillor Parrott, which she noted were very good, informative discussions. Cicely also congratulated Touchwood for its creation of the new accessible play structure. One final item of note, as Cicely stated, the Indigenous celebrations recently held in Nipua were very successful, with an estimated 2,200 pe 2, people in total participating. Next was the Manager of Operations report. Denny Sekwe stated that the Main Street drainage project is proceeding. Staff have completed the dig at Crocus, where new housing development has been proposed. There were also updates on the water treatment plant and land drainage project close to the new hospital. Next was new business. First, some property owners close to the 320 acres of land purchased by the town of Nipua earlier this year expressed concern about the rezoning of some of that land. A portion of the land is planned to be rezoned from agricultural to industrial. Property owners attended the council meeting and raised concerns directly to council that the change would negatively impact the value of their land. Another response was sent by email expressing similar disagreement with the proposed rezoning. Number two, the Beautiful Plains Community Medical Clinic Committee forwarded a letter to Town Council. The letter expressed the increasing competition in many communities to acquire new medical professionals, especially or specifically uh, physicians. The committee has asked for an increase in the grant amount received each year in order to stay competitive with other municipalities who are pursuing physicians as well. The formula for the increase would factor in population size and a $2 per capita levy from the rate pairs. For Nipua, that would increase their annual grant from $2,500 to $11,500. The previous grant amount has remained unchanged since 2011. The clinic committee will be sending similar letters to surrounding RMs related to their annual grants. Number three, council has approved entering into an agreement with the province of Manitoba on the construction and maintenance of a raw water pipeline within the control limits along PTH number five. Number four, the town of Nipua accepted a tender from Rob Smith & Son for $1.9 million on the expansion of the Oberon well mechanization and the twinning of the raw water supply. And lastly, second and third reading was given to the review of cemetery maintenance fees. A Legacy Beyond Bricks and Mortar by Owen Devereaux. Though it has now been about four years since St. James Anglican closed its church in Nipua, its legacy reaches well beyond simple bricks and mortar. It's a legacy of goodwill and good deeds still practiced to this day by its parishioners. It's a legacy kept vibrant through the partnership of Nipua's United Anglican Church. And it's a legacy that was recently celebrated on the grounds of their new home through the installation of a commemorative bench. The polished black marble and concrete bench sits next to the bell tower, close to the main entrance of the church located at 475 Mountain Avenue. It was created by Gwyn Brothers Memorials and commissioned by the congregation. Its message, which is etched into the bench's backrest, includes a brief history of the Anglican Church's former homes and a simple but poignant message that says, This bench is given to the glory of God and in loving memory of present and departed parishioners. Nancy Hunter and Jackie Snyder shared details with the banner and press on the creation of this special commemoration. They noted it was inspired by the rededication of the St. James Anglican Bell 
at the United Church back in 2023. When the bell went up, we decided that it would be nice to have some kind of area, a spot that's at church, but not in church type of place, noted Snyder. For the next year or so, Anglican members decided to donate money towards the bench. It was also decided early on by those in charge of this project that they weren't going to ask for money. They wanted to ensure that any support given were not taking away from any other fundraising efforts already established by the congregation. After the money needed was raised, Hunter said they went about coming up with the concept of the bench and the message it would convey. Hunter said, I think people had been to many different cemeteries around Nipah and area and, and seen a bench and those types of benches were often commemorative. So it seemed like a wonderful place to have the etching of the church there, the history of it. But beyond the history, Hunter and Snyder stated that sometimes it's just nice to have a bench available for you while you're out and about. What can we give to our community that also has a welcome message, Hunter said. The bench and the bell are not the only pieces of legacy that live on for the Anglican Church. Inside their new location, an entire room has been turned into what could be described as a mini recreation of their former home. There are four small rows of seating with the pews from the old building, which was located near the Yellowhead Highway that are pointed towards the altar. As well, some of the stained glass windows have been saved and are displayed upon the wall and window of the room. Snyder and Hunter remarked that there are some special, more personal events that are held within the space. It is very important to note that these additions by the Anglican wing of the church are not ab about separation, but rather respect for their local history. Hunter and Snyder were quick to note that those who were part of the old United Church were very welcoming to the new partnership. The pair added that the bench, the room and all the other physical items are just a small part of the Anglican legacy. Its true legacy is paying respect to those who came before and taught them the value of giving back. Its presence was felt in Nipah for generations, for over a hundred years, and it's respecting your elders, respecting those who came before, but it's also just continuing the legacy of giving, said Hunter. So here we have a beautiful picture of the uh, bench in front of the church. It will help preserve the legacy of St. James Anglican. All right. Congratulations to Harris Pharmacy of Nipah. Harris Pharmacy's Big Move by Nipah Banner and Press. Below is a brief timeline of the 366 Mountain Avenue Harris Pharmacy Build and Move. As per the edition of the Nipah Banner and Press that it appeared, February 24, 2023, Harris Pharmacy announced that it planned to move from 424 Mountain to 366 Mountain. The location at 424 is actually two buildings that have been joined together. The buildings have previously been occupied by Stedman's store, which was the south portion, and uh, Harris Pharmacy, the central part of the store, and Wally's jeweler, which was the north part of the building. Hmm. On December 8, 2023, on this date, a photo appeared in the Nipua Banner Press showcasing the progress that had been made thus far at 366 Mountain Avenue. Construction on the framing walls for the building was moving ahead. February 2nd, 2024, as work continued on the new building, the Harris Drug Sign was taken down from the location at 424 Mountain Avenue in preparation for the move. This sign was a long time a well-recognized part of the building's storefront. Following, note, following the full move, this sign was rehung at 366 Mountain location. 
April 26, 2024, construction was making good progress with the outside shaping up well. The Banner Press was able to take a closer look indoors and take some shots of the interior work. September 6, the much anticipated project was nearing completion. In this edition, finishing touches were being added to the building, including brand new signs for the storefront. September 27, 2024, this edition highlighted the official opening of the 366 Mountain Avenue Harris Pharmacy location, marking the end of approximately two years of planning and construction. There was a partial opening on September 23rd with the full full day, first full day of, of begin open taking place on September 24th. So these are just a few of the, the pictures. This is how it appeared on October 8th, 2024. See there, Pharma, Pharma Choice up in the red, Harris Pharmacy underneath, and the old Harris Drugs <laughs> on the side. So cool. And this just shows the empty lot, the start of the building. This is their old address. The insides taking shape and workers putting up the new sign and of course here is the Nipua banner uh, sorry the, the Harris Pharmacy staff Heather Toderick and staff are pleased to welcome customers to their new location we extend thanks to all our suppliers and tradespeople who made our new location into a reality oh and here's some more pictures the old Harris drugs sign um, Let's see. Yeah, just show some portions of the new store. Um, oh yeah, so a special insert. An, an error occurred last week um, in the Nipah Banner and Press, which resulted in the Austin Fire Department being missed in the October 4th fire safety feature. So the Nipah Banner and Press extends its apologies and wants to include that the town of Austin and their fire department. Now we have another old fashioned picture, Old Canada Outdoor Fun. This photo of youth engaging in some outdoor games was taken at Riding Mountain National Park. Old Canada series lists this as being sometime in the 1950s. Further details can be sent to Casper via newsroom at nipoapress.com. So this is a game of outdoor checkers. Actually, the beach in Minnedosa still uses theirs. It's, it's very similar. All right, now we're on to a sports page. It's entitled, If, if Only Every Game Could Be Played in Nipua, <laughs> by Owen Devereux. The Nipua Titans are a tale of two teams dependent entirely, it seems, upon the location of the game. The latest examples of this included a dominant 4-1 win at home on Friday, October 4th at the Yellowhead Centre over the Winnipeg Blues. Unfortunately, it was followed up with a flat effort in Weiwei Sakapo versus the Wolverines, which led to a 6-1 loss on Tuesday, October the 8th. These latest results have the Titans' record at 3-4-0-1 on the season. All three wins, 3-1-0, have been in front of the home faithful at the Yellowhead, while away from Nipua, they remain winless at 0-3-0-1. The rest of October should prove to be a real challenge for Nipua, both home and away, from the Yellowhead Centre. The team has eight games on the calendar, including three versus the currently undefeated Selkirk Steelers, who are 9-0-0-0. As well, the Titans must face the always difficult Steinbach Pistons, the Niverville Nighthawks, and the Swan Valley Stampeders. The next home game is scheduled for Sunday, October 13th against Steinbach. The start time is 6.30 p.m. So currently in the MJHL standings, Nipua 
sits at third as and um, at, with seven points. Um, the Blizzards sit in first place in the Western Division with 12 points. Dauphin Kings in second place, Nipua in third. The game after that will be on October 18th at the Yellowhead Center against Swan Valley Stampeders at 7.30. All right, Miles for Mental Health hosts Nipua Connect. Miles for Mental Health hosted a come and go style event in the Yellowhead Hall on Monday, October the 7th. Known as Nipua Connects, a variety of booths from local and area organizations were set up with all welcome to attend. Held from 4 to 8 p.m., it was an opportunity to learn about the different well-being resources available in Nipua and area. Sessions for students were held earlier in the day with those managing the booths noting there was high interactivity, excellent questions and more. Booths ranged from local health professionals, Prairie Mountain Health resources and much more. These included, but were certainly not limited to, Westman Crisis Services, Nipua Settlement Services and Settlement Workers in Schools, Nipua Community Ministries Centre, Salvation Army, Adult Community Mental Health, Nipua and Area Pride, Sexuality Education Resources Centre and the Nipua Men's Shed. Cool. And there are just a few pictures of it inside the Yellowhead Hall. Oh, here's another, oh, a couple more um, soccer notes for the sports page. NACI Tigers win Zone 7 Girls Soccer. For the fourth straight year, the Nipua Tigers have proven to be the best team to hit the pitch in Zone 7 Soccer. The Tigers defeated Minidosi in the Zone Championship game on Thursday, October the 3rd by the score of 3-0. With the win, Nipua earned itself a fourth consecutive Zone banner as well as a spot in the Provincial High School Soccer Championship. The team will hope to improve upon last year's provincial results as they finished third overall in the 2023 tournament which was held in Dauphin. The 2024 provincials are set for October 11th and 12th and will be played in Minidosa. Best of luck to Nipua as well as the host club Minidosa at the event. And here the NACI boys soccer team also earn a spot at Provincials. The Nipah Tigers boys team have qualified for the MHS AA Provincial Soccer Championship with a wild card play-in victory over MC Miller on Monday, October the 7th in Portage La Prairie. They defeated MC Miller in a shootout to move on to the Provincials which are scheduled for again Minnedosa October 11th and 12th. So best of luck to this team also. <clears throat> Barbecue, a thank you to Minnedosa Museum volunteers. On October 4th, the Minnedosa District Museum and Heritage Village held a barbecue to thank volunteers and friends of the museum for their continued support throughout the 2024 season. Approximately 65 volunteers and guests were in attendance. With their continued support, we provide school tours prior to season opening and we are able to accommodate large groups for private tours. Without volunteers tending the gates at village events such as Farmers Festival and Heritage Day, running the kids train, providing birdhouse kits and running the concessions, these events would not be the successes they are. We have volunteers who plant flowers, weed and water to keep the site looking beautiful. Many work, work tirelessly in the background doing upkeep of our buildings. There are many small jobs around the village that quietly get done with no one knowing. Hours and hours of volunteer time 
are spent working to keep the museum looking beautiful for the public. As an added thank you, there were many door prize draws such as complimentary passes, books, prints of the Octagon building, and gift cards. And here's a picture of a new play structure in Brookdale. When you tell the kids to go out and play, you'd best provide someplace fun for them to go out and do so. The community of Brookdale has done just that with the installation of a brand new climber at their elementary school's playground. The project was two years in the making and led by the local parent council who organized 50-50 and prized table raffles, as well as mum's pantry fundraisers. With all those efforts, while all those efforts did push them closer to the fundraising goal, it was the generous donations from Rob Smith and Son, Farm Credit Canada, and the Beautiful Plains Community Foundation that finally pushed them over the top. The exact cost of the project is undisclosed. The climber was designed, however, by Blue Imp, an Alberta-based playground structure company and installed by Square One Construction over the course of the summer. Going into the start of the new year, the new equipment appears to already be getting rave reviews and is being enjoyed by the students and community as a whole. Joanna Evans of Brookdale noted to the Banner and Press it had been many years since any new additions had been made to the structure at the small school and that it would not have been possible without the support of the great community members and some local businesses. <coughs> All right, a chance to connect. Footnotes exhibit seeks to inspire hope, interest in conservation by Casper Verhan. A celebration of wildlife and its tremendous diversity has made its home at Arts Forward in Nipua. This comes in the form of footnotes, an exhibit by artist Stephanie Bretesche. Sorry if I've said it wrong. Bretesche's works have previously been featured in the Westman Regional Traveling Art Exhibit, the Wasagaming Art Gallery, with the McCreary Art Council and the Manitoba Rural Northern Juried Art Show. A self-described tumbleweed adventurer, Bertesche originally hails from Germany and has been a Canadian resident for many years now, living at communities such as Rossburn, Nipua, and currently Minnedosa. She was drawn to the arts, the wilderness, and its creatures from a young age with her experiences in Canada, adding fuel to that passion. Being a newcomer to this beautiful country and seeing animals in the wild never ceases to amaze me. With my paintings, I attempt to capture wildlife in a way that will allow the viewers to connect with the animal by conveying relatable traits and emotions. That connection is something Bretesche hopes will inspire further awareness of habitat and wildlife conservation, a major goal of her display. Conservation is a matter dear to my heart, and I think a lot of young people too. A big reason for anxiety these days is our changing world, and not that I want to hype this up, the climate crisis, but I've been living here for 16 years, and even for me to see some of the changes in the weather events, tornado warnings all summer long, that didn't used to be a thing, right? For me, being new here, I can see that in a flash. Bertesche explained further that the inspiration for the footnotes exhibit stemmed from a Canadian Geographic article on climate change. The article was quoting along the lines of, in the chronicles of the warming world, vanishing animals and habitats are going to be a footnote. 40 to 50 years from now, the history books are going to be talking about towns that were destroyed or the bad main events that affected people. But whether or not there was an animal species that disappeared, that might be a footnote. And that stuck with me a little bit. It's terrible that it's happening to, to people. There's no judgment there. But I wanted to give a space to celebrate what we have 
and give people a chance to connect with the wildlife and diversity we have. I think once you connect, you're more passionate about protecting it for future generations. Footnotes was originally going to highlight endangered species, but this was changed in order to focus on a message of hope and change that while there will likely be losses, there are successes too. It, she said, it's not just a story about animal extinction. It's a story about animal adaption. There are species out there that are great at adapting to changes. It's not of habitat loss, it's habitat change. And what will that look like? She's enthused. So this exhibit is mostly the good stories and highlighting the positives. Bratesh's works are a vibrant collection of acrylics and watercolor, ranging from highly accurate to a more playful approach. Some works even feature a style known in photography as double exposure, a picture within a picture. Footnotes officially opened on October the 1st with students with student meetings slash tours and a fundraising lunch for CATS TNR Rescue. There is still plenty of time to see the display as it will remain at Arts Forward until October the 30th. So this is a, a picture of Stephanie here, um, smiling for the camera with her piece called Beneath the Surface. Here, a portion of the crowd who turned out to the fundraiser Lunch for Cats uh, TNR, which was part of Bertesche's exhibit opening. And here a portion of her artwork called Curiosity. <laughs> Two foxes. September Challenge goes the extra mile. Grit Force Fitness raises support for local family dealing with medical ordeal by Owen Devereaux. The most recent exercise challenge at Grit Force Fitness has done a lot more than burn a few calories. A portion of money raised from the September challenge has been generously donated to the Oyevota family in Nipua to help with their son Sammy's medical expenses connected to his battle with bone cancer. The treatment for this a variety of cancer requires several trips into Winnipeg each month for chemotherapy, which very quickly adds up in terms of e expenses such as gas, food and lodgings. Grit Forest co-owner Sherry Hawkins said everyone involved with the fitness centre wanted to help them in some way, and the September challenge synced up nicely to that goal. Sammy was a member of our classes before his diagnosis. Sammy's younger brothers attend our youth classes. Both Becky and Sam have attended classes with us and done programs with us. The Oyevota family has always been supportive and a part of Grit Force Fitness family for years. We knew our gym family would step up and help out. We have a very giving gym community and when we heard about Sammy's diagnosis, we wanted to help, stated Hawken. In total, 69 people signed up for September, which set a goal of each participant aiming for 10,000 steps a day. From there, $10 of the sign-up fee for the program would go to helping with associated costs as Sammy fights cancer. In a message shared upon social media, Becky Oyevoto said, Thank you all for your love and support. You are all so, so amazing. Thank you, Grit Force Fitness. Amazing business, amazing community. All right, now we're going to go back to this page. All right, um, we'll start with Ken Waddell, right in the center. It's entitled 55 Years in the Making. 55 years ago on October 11th, it was a Saturday and it was a bit cool and blustery. It can easily be said that it was the most important day in my life. Christine and I got married that day in the Verdon Presbyterian Church. Our wedding reception was at the former Scarth School, which by 1969 had been converted into a community center. 
It was a memorable, memorable day that included family, good food, some nice fiddle music played by Alex Milne. It was also, it also included a very weak speech by me, a disappointment to my wife. Christine's parents were Henry and Jean Lobel, and her family still lives at Scarth and are very active members in the Verdon area. We were university students, and it's amazing that we were able to somehow afford to get married, rent a one-bedroom apartment in the Fort Rouge area of Winnipeg. Our wedding took place on Thanksgiving weekend. What better weekend to get married? Our honeymoon was a night in a little roadside motel and a Sunday drive in the valley north of Verdon. I believe we explored an old stone church and enjoyed what was left of the fall colors. By Tuesday morning, we were back at class at U of M. <clears throat> the next year was a whirlwind. By our first anniversary, I had graduated with an ag degree, Christine with a teaching certificate, and a one year of arts. I had served a term of on the U of M Senate, finished off working with the Manitoban, the U of M newspaper, and moved to Carberry to work for Carnation Foods, which is now McCain's. I worked a term position at Brandon University with the BUNTEP program, moved back to Winnipeg to work on a tomato greenhouse research project, oh yes, and had our first son Michael. By January 1971, we had moved to Nipua, and now 50 plus years later, we are pretty much rooted in the western Manitoba scene. Now we have two sons, a daughter-in-law, four four grandchildren, two grandsons-in-law, and four great-grandsons to fill out the family package to date. We have farmed, ran an auction business, operated a newspaper for 35 years, and now are responsible for three community papers and a local TV station. Just on a trivial note, I can say I have been in publishing for 58 years, as my first one was in 1966. We have had financial challenges, political wins and losses, and numerous health challenges. The most recent and serious one has been Christine's battle with cancer and chemotherapy. She is recovering. It's a slow and arduous process, but she is doing much better. Through all this, and I won't speak for Christine, but I think she agrees we have been blessed. I summarize our life with words on a hymn, of a hymn. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. I have made lots of mistakes, said some things I shouldn't have said, but I stand by all that is above in this column. We have been blessed and assailed with some troubles, but nothing earth-shaking. We are blessed by God and with family, blessed by this part of Manitoba and by all the communities we live and work in, blessed by many great people we currently live beside and we're blessed by those who have passed away. Today, we hear a lot of F words, but I have four of them. Faith, family, friends, and finances. Just be sure to keep them in that order. Disclaimer, the views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the newspaper staff. Next, we have Rita Friesen homebodies. This week her title is Thanksgiving. Also very appropriate. There is a day set aside for giving thanks. Perhaps we do need a reminder to be grateful. It should be a daily practice. As I mature, read that as I get older, it becomes more and more necessary to be thankful, to recognize the many great people and things that fill my life. I have family, friends, food, faith, and there are times when I would list them in different orders of significance. Laundry. I, do, I love doing the laundry and am hard pressed not to wash clothes that aren't even dirty. There is a deep satisfaction for me to be able to, without much effort, wash, dry, and put away a plethora of clothing and household items. I heard stories of my maternal grandmother, the one who raised 12 children on a farm, welcoming a trundle washer that was powered by an electric motor. 
No more arm killing hours spent scrubbing on a washboard or swinging the arm of the half circle washing tub. The clothesline was the constant, winter and summer, often needing a strong tree <laughs> branch or a piece of lumber to help support the weight of the wet laundry. I remember that. I watched my mother welcome the ringer washer, still heating the water and bucketing the wastewater outside. Wet washed items were piled high until it was time to change the wash water to the rinse water, and then they were lugged outside to the clothesline. I, wa I watched the household welcome the electric clothes dryer, saving many a frostbitten finger or nose. I do miss the smell of fresh frozen laundry thawing while draped over doorways and chairs, but I don't miss that enough to replicate it. <laughs> My routine now consists of loading a washing machine, pressing buttons, adding detergent and walking away. <laughs> For most of the year, I still use the great outdoors as the dryer because I have that option. I am thankful for laundry. KitchenAids. Both, my, both of my grandmothers had household help after the children left home. That gave them time to grow gloxinias, play with grandchildren, and go visiting. I heard the stories of my maternal grandmother, the mother of 12, having a summer kitchen so that the constant cooking wouldn't overheat the, the house. I heard of the wonders of the warming oven that served as an incubator for my preemie aunt, the bed warmers that were heated in the oven and sent upstairs with the children, the wonder of the kettle simmering on the back burner for coffee on demand. I saw my mother embrace the electric gadgets in her kitchen from yogurt makers to dehydrators. I am thankful for the microwave. <clears throat> and modern travel. I heard of my grandparents relying on horsepower to get to town and go visiting. Horsepower transportation and horses for all the farm work. I saw my parents enjoy travel across North America with the most reliable vehicle. Currently, I hold title to what I consider a luxury vehicle, larger than I need, more comfortable than I could imagine, and reliable. These are only some of my daily thank yous. The safety of my home, my community, and my country are huge. Take time to reflect on what all we have that is thankworthy. Faithfully Yours by Neil Stroshine. This week, his article is entitled, Thanks for Memories. This coming Monday is Thanksgiving Day in Canada. On this day, we are encouraged to reflect on the things we have received, the good times we have shared, the hard times we have endured, and the lessons we have learned in the past 12 months. From these categories, each of us should be able to list many things for which to give thanks. Over the next few weeks, I want to share some items from my list. This week, with apologies to the late Bob Hope, I want to say thanks for memories. Although I am a farm kid and sometimes believe that I have more dirt than blood in my veins, my memories of the farm and farming are about as primitive as they come. I am awestruck by the incredible advances in equipment and technology used by today's farmers. I would be totally lost trying to operate any of today's farm equipment. Our farm had one tractor, a 930 case, the kind where the seat hung out over the back drawbar. It had a six speed transmission, hand clutch, live power takeoff and only two hydraulic circuits. We used that tractor for all the field work and choring our small farm required. And since it had no cab, we had to bundle up when doing early spring or late fall tillage to protect ourselves from cold temperatures and brisk winds. But as we all did in the 60s, we made do with what we had. It was all we could afford. The same applied to our farm truck, a 1945 Mercury two-ton with a V8 valve in block 
engine and a four-speed transmission that had a top highway speed of 35 to 40 miles per hour. Like our tractor, that truck also did everything. One day, it would be hauling grain to the local elevator. The next day, it would haul pigs to market. And the day after, it would make a trip to the local mine for a load of coal. I took my driver's ed in that truck. With three quarter sections of open field for practice, I soon became quite proficient as a driver, but not sufficiently skilled to avoid breaking two rear view mirrors on the truck. Our farm was a mixed farm. Wheat was our cash crop. Oats and barley were ground into feed for our livestock, dairy and beef cattle and market hogs. There was always more work to do than there was time to do it, but by working together we got it all done. And on the second Sunday in October, as we gathered for our Thanksgiving service, we were greeted by a display of every conceivable kind of fruit, vegetable, melon, squash, gourd, and home preserve our church family could put together. And that display often included two huge bouquets of gladiolas grown, picked, and arranged by my mom. It's been 55 years since I left the farm to begin my training for ministry. But memories of those years are just as vivid today as they have ever been. I thank God for those who guided my personal, intellectual, and spiritual growth during my years on the farm. Those lessons have remained with me. I have not always lived by them as consistently as I should have, but when I have strayed, they have brought me back to the core beliefs that have been the foundation of my faith since childhood and that continue to guide me today. And so today I can say, thanks Lord for these memories. Next, we have Counting Our Blessings by Tara Cowenhofen, Faith and Family. This past week, we had sick kids at our house. Between ear infections and sleeplessness and coughing and runny noses and endless laundry, I found myself complaining and if I'm being brutally honest, ungrateful. But I was truly stopped in my ungratefulness as I watched the footage of the flooding and damage from Hurricane Helene. And in the midst of the heartbreak, the fear now with the impending Hurricane Milton, it was a stark reminder to me that the things that annoy me and the things I complain about should not be. So today I just want to take a moment to take pause and to hold pause to hold space for all those that have storm prepped, evacuated, and are starting over again. For those that came home to their homes destroyed only to turn back around to evacuate again. For those who have lost loved ones who may never be recovered. For those who can't evacuate and are praying desperately on their knees for safety. For those that have had to ration their food and water for their children because they are stranded and don't know when help is coming. Today, I am on my knees praying for you, my heart breaking with yours. Today, I am reminded as this horror unfolds in our neighboring country that my house still stands, my loved ones are alive and around me, my children are safe, I have food and water, I have electricity and heat. My complaints should not be complaints at all. As the world watches and waits, as we hold our breath, as Florida braces for yet another devastating impact, as those sitting in vehicles gridlocked on the highway, praying they make it out before the surge hits. As the elderly, the sick, those without means to evacuate, sit and pray. I am reminded of the power of prayer and God's sovereignty in all circumstances. I am reminded that he brings out the best in people during hard times. He helps them together to help one another. For every devastating video I have watched this week, I've seen one of people on horseback rescuing families, hauling in supplies. I've seen helicopters, air rescuing people and animals, dropping cases of water to people whose roads have washed out. So today, whether you believe in God or not, whether you pray regularly or not, whether you are watching this unfold or not, please take a moment to send up a prayer a thought, a kind word for those walking through unthinkable circumstances. When you open your eyes, I want you to look around you and count your blessings. Be reminded that your home is standing, 
Your family is safe. You have food and water and to be filled with an undeniable sense of gratitude. All right. I'll read a letter to the editor, I guess. I have seen the best of Manitobans. Note the following letter was submitted by Premier Wab Canoe. Over the past year, I have had the wonderful honour of leading your provincial government here in Manitoba. During that time, I have seen the best of Manitobans. I had the honour of standing on the beaches of Normandy with our veterans who, as young people, fought to protect our way of life, human rights, democracy and respect for all people. I joined students and educators as we launched a province-wide school food program that ensures every student in Manitoba has a healthy meal when they need one. I listened to the courageous voices of the family members of murder victims who stood up, demanded justice, and are now working with us to bring their loved ones home. This year, Manitobans came together in the face of great difficulties. I heard the sadness and the pain of the people in Carmen who lived through terrible violence and unspeakable tragedy. And it goes on to say, <clears throat> I visited with people in northern Manitoba who were evacuated from their homes because of wildfires, not knowing if they would be able to return. Our health minister and I traveled to hospitals and mental health facilities in every part of our province to hear directly from the workers on the front lines about what, can, what we can do to, help to fix health care, our government's top priority. These conversations have guided our work to hire more health care workers, open ERs, and make sure you have the care you need close to home. A year ago, we ran a positive campaign that was focused on you, the people of Manitoba. After years of division, we are building a Manitoba where no one is left behind. From fixing health care to making life more affordable, our team is bringing Manitobans together from all walks of life and creating a path to a future where every young person in Manitoba can succeed and reach their full potential. On election night, I said your government cannot take the first step. You have to want to take it. But if you do take that step, our government will meet you. Right now, every kid can access a meal when they show up to school. We are creating a path to housing, a path to recovery, and a path to working and living the positive life that you dream of for yourself. If you take the first step, our government will be there to meet you and ensure that you get all the support you need on your path to living a good life. Today, we celebrate this anniversary not as an accomplishment from any member of our team. Instead, we celebrate it with a great humility that comes from recognizing the enormous responsibility we we have to you, the people of Manitoba. Our commitment to you is the same as it was one year ago, that we are going to continue working every single day to make Manitoba a better place for you, for your kids, and for your grandkids. So thank you to the people of Manitoba. Thank you for trusting us to lead your provincial government. I look forward to another year of working together for all Manitobans. By Wab Canoe, Premier of Manitoba. All right. <clears throat> Lastly, I am going to read a little bit from Looking Back. 75 years ago, formerly a well-known resident of Nipua, Alan R. Ramsey has received his captain's mission in the Canadian Army Active Force Army Headquarters announced. Captain Ramsey was one of 12 university students commissioned as second lieutenants a year ago at the start of their final year in dentistry. All now are serving as dental officers with the Royal Canadian Dental Corps. Now residing in Montreal, Alan is the son of A.A. A. Ramsey of Winnipeg and the late Mrs. Ramsey. He received his schooling at the public and high schools here and for some years a reporter on the Nipua press staff. Later, he attended normal school and taught school for some time. He served with the RCAF during the Second World War when he was stationed for a considerable time at Montreal. 
At the end of the war, he enrolled in the Canadian Officers Training Corps and graduated in dentistry from McGill University in Montreal. Hmm. Now, speaking of dentistry, 50 years ago, October 10, 1974, a dental clinic is now in operation at Alonza School, conducting an education program, fluorides, brushings, and fillings, mainly for students from the grades 1 to 6 level, and giving treatment for those urgently requiring it in grades 7 to 9. It is hoped that parents can establish a regular dental treatment pattern with their family dentist as a supplement to the program at the school. Hmm that was formerly known as the Children's Dental Program, the Provincial Children's Dental Program, which is having a reunion in Winnipeg in a couple of weeks, celebrating 50 years. 20 years ago, October 11th, 2004, the fifth floor of Nipois East View Lodge has reopened following a summer shutdown. Faced with staffing shortages, Sorensen said the RHA had no choice but to close the fifth floor at the end of June. The fifth floor was chosen because the move affected only 11 residents, Sorensen said. The other three floors of the 125-bed care home are more heavily populated. So that's it. Uh, for the reading of the Nipah Banner and Press this week. Thank you for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next week. So, bye for now.